Hello and welcome to The Hub on CGTN. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. Our guest today is His Excellency Mr. Khalil Hashimi, the Pakistani ambassador to China. It's worth noting that this is Ambassador Hashimi's second posting in China after his first one some 15 years ago. What does the ambassador make of the quality and resilience of China-Pakistan odd-weather fraternity? What does he see as the headwinds that could potentially affect China-Pakistan relations and regional security going forward? Here's our conversation. His Excellency Ambassador Hashimi, good to finally sit down with you. You have been in China for around 10 months now. You've visited over 20 cities, met with people from a cross-section of society. Um, I mean, after all these time spent in China, what does this all-weather fraternity that people often, so often refer to between China and Pakistan mean to you now, personally? This is, as you know, uh, not that I have uh, just uh, visited 20 cities. This is my second time uh, in, in China. I was a counselor 15 years ago. But 30 years of diplomatic uh, service, so a lot of interaction with uh, my Chinese friends in the diplomatic world. So I have, uh, in many ways, uh, a personal experience. Also, if I could use the, the phrase that I am a personal witness to the uh, strengthening of Pakistan-China friendship, that wouldn't be far, far off. So I have seen it up close. I have worked on, on this uh, relationship in my individual capacity. I've been part of, uh, been fortunate to have been part of this process. And now as an ambassador, I'm at the forefront of uh, where um, this is like a daily, uh, a daily duty, I, I feel that uh, to nurture this relationship to even greater heights. Generations of leaders, diplomats, officials, artists, um, so many people from our two countries have uh, contributed to this uh, very unique, time-tested, all-weather, ironclad uh, relationship uh, that we have. And I think it is in the common interest of our two people and our two countries and our two institutions to foster this relationship in the new era because we have weathered many a storm before and we are also seeing a lot of uh, new storms on the horizon and I think it is uh, that is why I think it is even more important right now uh, to work for the further strengthening and deepening of our very unique and uh, ironclad friendship. Ambassador Hashimi, this year we're marking the 73rd anniversary of diplomatic relations of our two countries. To what do you attribute the strength and resilience of China-Pakistan fraternity, uh, two countries that share uh, you know, different cultures, different religions, and different um, forms of government? There is a high degree of strategic trust, uh, a tradition of mutual support, um, a tradition of standing by each other. And this has not just emerged out of thin air. There have been decades of work uh, behind it. And I think the foundation for it was laid by a shared understanding and a shared reading of how the world um, is evolving back in, for example, back in the 50s, 60s and 70s. I think our two countries belonging to the developing world, uh, having experienced, uh, you know, a very um, turbulent colonial past, uh, having seen the uh, difficulties uh, when you are, uh, you know, threatened by either your neighbors or from external forces which may be stronger than you. So some of those shared experiences of the past, but also the shared um, vision of how the region should actually uh, develop and how the ideals of peace prosperity and stability uh, could be uh, promoted. So I think one of the examples that I gave uh, to develop good uh, friendly and good neighborly relations was to conclude a border treaty between Pakistan and China in 1963 and that was very early in the days, in those days. Also Pakistan was the first non-communist country 
in 1964 to start uh, an airline to China. So Pakistan's airline became a window uh, to China. So, you know, uh, many outward travel, especially to the Western Hemisphere, uh, people would go either from Shanghai or Beijing through Karachi. Um, so I think these are some of the examples where um, I, I feel that we have the necessary solid foundation between our two countries to look at the world uh, and look at the region um, and then closely coordinate and consult and uh, face the, the new world and the, you know, the new developments and new uh, you know, headwinds, as you, as you said, and then uh, you know, shape our responses um, based on reality but also based on law and legality and uh, norms that have been evolved and we have uh, we now know as uh, two countries uh, having been uh, independent now for more than seven decades that adherence to international law adherence to these time tested principles is in the common interest of everyone yeah, Ambassador, you talked about previous storms, uh, even between brother states like ours, and also the external storms that might be affecting our relationships and the region that we live in. Maybe uh, you can specify some of those difficulties previously, how we resolve those difficulties in particular, and currently, what do you see as the biggest headwinds that could potentially impact our relationship? Well, first, I think in terms of the milestones or some of the key drivers of our uh, you know, all-weather friendship. I would say in the 60s, uh, and that was a peculiar time. So Pakistan was, was, was one of the first neighbors, if not the first one, to conclude a border treaty with China in 1963. So that was one of the defining moments and milestones in our relationship. I think another one was in 1971, and Prior to that, when Pakistan opened uh, windows uh, to China um, in the form of a rapprochement, a work quietly between the United States and How China. How Dr. Kissinger? So, over. yeah, he paid a lot of uh, many visits um, and they were um, kept uh, out of public eye. And that opened the world, um, and China was in the in the process of opening up in any case, and that was a major step. I think um, another one was when, um, at the turn of the century, when President Xi Jinping visited Pakistan, and we initiated the China-Pakistan Economic Corridor as the pioneering project. But there have been many um, occasions at the. Uh, multilateral level or international level, Pakistan and China have worked very closely at the UN Security Council, at the UN uh, Human Rights Council, at the um, different platforms which discuss uh, development issues, trade issues. Uh, so there is a very high degree of uh, you know, convergence uh, in approach and in, in our tactics. So we closely coordinate and consult. I think going forward, uh, what what I foresee is this friendship and this um, relationship getting even more stronger. And that is because uh, I think there is the fundamental convergence in our views and how we see the world, whether it is a matter of human development. So what China has done and is sharing with uh, the rest of the world, especially developing countries, so how to shape up a future of pro common prosperity uh, a future of, as President Xi Jinping says, a future of common destiny, a shared destiny for mankind in the new era. Whether it is the global security initiative or global civilization uh, initiative. So all of these issues, they touch on you know, different aspects of uh, new global alignments uh, or uh, global and regional order that is uh, getting shaped. So uh, that's why I see that the previous convergence that we have had, the previous very close relationship that we have, we, we have a very high degree of strategic trust. We have a very uh, fine tradition of supporting each other in good times, but also not in, in, in very good times. 
So that these are the reasons I, I see uh, great prospects of our friendship uh, gaining uh, strength from strength. You're watching breaking news on CGTN. headlines from around the world. Welcome to the world today on CGTN. Compared to your first posting, which was, what, 15 years ago, and during your current posting of past 10 months, what changes, what transformations have impressed you the most? Maybe some moments and stories that you can share with our audience? Uh, I think first, uh, and in, in two words if I can say that, very impressive. Um, so let me explain it. A very impressive in, uh, in terms of economic progress. So it's very evident in the form of, uh, you know, the development dividends spreading to all parts of uh, Chinese society. So this economic development has been people-centered. So I see people uh, even more prosperous, even more empowered. That is also manifest in the number of cars and vehicles that are on the roads, uh, in the number of uh, e-bikes that people use and in the number of people traveling outside. Uh, so that indicates a lot of, uh, you know, uh, disposable income uh, in, the, in the form of so many high quality restaurants, uh, high quality infrastructure, uh, 45,000 kilometers of high speed rail uh, network in those 15 years. I remember in 2008, there was only one line that I remember of, and that was from Beijing to Tianjin or maybe there was one odd another one. That's like in 15 years, 3,000 kilometers of uh, high-speed uh, train network every year. So that's quite remarkable. And of course, the most obvious one is ecology. Um, and by ecology, I mean is the air quality, the, the green forest cover, uh, which has expanded massively when you fly in from outside into Beijing these days, um, it's hard to recognize it as Beijing. I remember 15 years ago, there was very little forest cover if you flew. Uh, there were patches, but now it's, it looks like a big green uh, cover. And you see, of course, also concrete uh, blocks, a uh, lot of high-rise buildings, but I think it's been fairly in the larger scheme of things, a lot of forest cover, a lot of attention has been paid to water resources uh, re being regenerated. Um, also rivers, uh, uh, lakes, a lot of attention is being paid uh, to those. So I have seen in, in some of these cities that I have visited, not just in Beijing, um, so many cities they have made uh, tremendous progress in improving the air quality, in greening those cities, in um, you know improving uh, the quality of water as well. So um, agriculture is another area uh, which is tied to environment and I think there's been fantastic progress. But the best part that I like is that on all these fronts, uh, the social, economic and environmental the best part is that China is not just, you know, enjoying or reaping the benefits. It is the sharing of these experiences, these benefits, this prosperity that China has acquired, sharing it with the rest of the world. And I think that's what makes uh, China and its policies so attractive and so commendable. 
And you said previously that China is not、uh, proselytizing, preaching, but sharing, and that is a difference from previous paradigms, perhaps. Absolutely. So China is not asking any country to fashion their political system in a particular way. China is not interfering in the internal affairs of、uh, anyone. Although China is is a world power, if it wanted to, it it could, but it is. Adhering strictly to what it says, so China is walking the talk. So that's why I think there are countries, and organization, and peoples see China as credible, as a credible interlocutor, as a credible model, a model or as an example where China has done so well. Whether it is achieving high levels of employment, prosperity, economic and、uh, environmental, social advancement, so I see China. Is not preaching people. Okay, you should, if you want to progress economically, or if you want to have social and political stability, you should act exactly like what China did. China is saying that the social, economic, and other systems they need to be suited to your own circumstances, and China is willing to help should you ask for it. And if you need, China, you will find China there. I wanted to ask you about His Excellency Prime Minister Sheikh Bas Sharif's、uh, visit to China、uh, this time around. That was about three months ago. There have been a number of deliverables.、Uh, three, four months onward since that、uh, historic visit. What do you see as the important、uh, outcomes, and how,、uh, most importantly, do you see the implementation of those projects, especially when it comes to the economy and trade? I think we have written a new chapter in our relationship, and this new chapter is marked by direction towards industrial cooperation, more enhanced. We are aiming for investment-led growth.、Um, why? Because we want to enhance our productive capacity, and through that productive capacity, to increase our exports. And what better place than China? So Chinese companies, enterprises, they are already present, but we are encouraging them. We have identified, after a lot of、uh, you know research work, identified around 13 sectors of economy. For example, from mines and minerals to iron and steel, chemical fertilizers,、uh, oil refineries, agriculture, IT. And so on and so forth, and traditional sectors where China, where Pakistan is good at, it's like textiles,、uh, leather, and footwear, and plastics. So we are encouraging and working very closely with the、uh, Chinese enterprises. So when the Prime Minister was here, we organized a business conference. So we organized、um, close to 1,000 meetings. So that was like eight, eight and a half minutes, very quick meetings. So that's we have generated that momentum, and that momentum has endured. And the example is that around 50 uh, you know, companies in that、um, business conference、uh, in Shenzhen,、uh, they were also present last month in Pakistan. But more than just 50, 160 companies in one sector, food and agriculture, they participated. And now,、uh, just as we speak,、uh, we are participating for the first time. The embassy has taken the initiative to organize an investment conference, and we are pursuing a new approach where we haven't asked our government a single、uh, RMB to organize and spend money on. So we reached out to enterprises in Pakistan. So this is what I mean. Going forward, industrial cooperation. It doesn't mean that we would. Not pursue the government-to-government, G-to-G, big projects in infrastructure, energy. That is going to continue because we have, in the last ten years of、uh, China-Pakistan economic corridor, we have done、uh, covered a lot of ground. Over 26 billion dollar investment,、uh, over 8,000 megawatts of、uh, electricity added to our、uh, grid, more than 800 kilometers of、uh, high-quality highways. More than 800 kilometers of fiber optic cable laid between our two countries, and over 800 kilometers of transmission lines having been. This is just some of the、uh, you know headline figures. More importantly, more than 200,000 jobs,、uh, livelihoods were、uh, created through these investments. 
But we are determined and we are working very closely with um, our Chinese friends in different institutions. We are now working on phase two and high quality upgraded version of CPEC 2. So a lot of focus would be not only in industrial cooperation, but also, you know, continue to work on infrastructure. And Five areas of growth, livelihood, innovation, green development and inclusivity. Yeah, but if you look at, for example, just growth or innovation or inclusivity, so these are concepts or areas which resonate very closely with what President Xi Jinping has emphasized in the eight key points after the Belt and Road Forum. So they also resonate very closely with our national framework, uh, economic development framework, which is five E's. It is exports, it is environment, it is e-Pakistan, it is education, and it is equity. So they are in sync with you know, what President Xi Jinping has articulated. So this is what we are working very closely with our partners in China to uh, develop a roadmap and then a pipeline of projects, programs, um, so that we, uh, you know, build even further on the progress that has already been achieved. Each day, there are millions of stories. Each one can open new perspectives, new possibilities. Wherever you look, we are there to see, discover, explore. We put the pieces together to find what really matters to you. All around the world, all around the clock. Our reporters are at home across the globe. From our headquarters in Beijing and production centers in Washington, Nairobi, and London. Stories from across the globe, reaching people across the globe. CGTN. See the difference. When it comes to improving Pakistan's industrial capacity, uh, what is the strengths of Pakistani society that the outside world don't readily know uh, when it comes to its youthful population, its market potential, and its, um, uh, you know, fledgling, uh, or should I say, its growing, ever-growing industrial capacity? So, four things. First is the location. I think we are located, in, it is also a difficult geography, but it is also very well uh, placed. So, we are a connector of South Asia, Central Asia, West Asia. And this is where the role of Pakistan-China relationship is very extremely important. So we provide not only road connectivity, railway connectivity, but also the, the sea or the port connectivity. So it's first is the location. The second is the youthful population. Uh, out of the 240 million people, the fifth largest in the world, uh, over 130 million uh, are under the age of 30. I think what is more important is that it is their English speaking skill and it is their IT skills, they are very tech savvy. So there are a lot of startups, there are people who are very good at IT services, mathematics, science and technology, brilliant kids, boys and girls. The third thing is the labor cost. It's a major factor when you are investing. So we have uh, people and young people with skills and the, the, the cost of uh, labor is also uh, very competitive compared to other markets. So that's the third factor. I think the fourth factor is the China-Pakistan economic corridor having provided a very solid foundation. So it's a developing economy. The rate of return in a country like Pakistan on investment is in double digit. So if you invest in a mature market, uh, your rate of return may be 3, 4, or 5 percent. What we are talking about uh, in Pakistan is uh, double digit, that is 
above and beyond 15 percent. So that's a lot of attraction for investors to consider. So it's a, it's a big consumer market as well when you have 130 million people who are under 30, but then the broader population is 240 million. It's a big market, big consumer market to sell your products and for people to be able to buy those products. I personally am um, having the honor of visiting your country and reading your newspapers, watching the televisions there for, for a, uh, you know, a quite some time, two weeks on. I personally would think that uh, it would be a great idea for our Pakistani brothers and sisters uh, to help us improve our publicity, especially publicity with the Western world. Because if you look at the Chinese messaging system, uh, we do have room to improve. And uh, Pakistan, with this heritage, uh, being an English-speaking society for part of the population, can help China tremendously with that regard. What do you I think, agree. Ambassador? I, I agree, and I think uh, some work is already underway in the sense that we have a huge diaspora in um, in the Western countries, in the United States, in Europe, in UK, in Australia, Canada, English-speaking world. And um, as I said, this friendship, that unique friendship that we have, um, is has permeated on both sides at the grassroots level. So you can pick up, uh, you know, randomly, you and you can take a sampling through your platform. Go to the a nook and corner of Pakistan and Pakistani media coming here and going to any part of China and asking and introducing himself or herself. And I have experienced it myself uh, when I was previously here and even when this time, without introducing myself that I am the ambassador of Pakistan, when I, I just say that I am from Pakistan. So there is a twinkle in the eye and there is a big smile. Yeah. And the first word that comes out of it is Pathye. Mm -hmm. And uh, in Pakistan, you would see uh, that many a times people would just express, if you, if you mention you are from China, and they will say, brother. Yeah, I went friend. through that yeah. pleasantly. So this also, uh, you know, uh, also gets permeated to people or our diaspora, which is living outside. So in many ways, those people who are close uh, to media or in government circles, I, I am sure they do in their personal capacity or where, whichever role they, uh, uh, they have, um, they help promote and especially those people who come and visit China more frequently. I think what we are passing through is a, a very unique and new era where there is a lot of misunderstanding about China. I think a lot of young people, many people from the Western world, they need to visit and China has done the right thing opening up these you know, and unilaterally opening visa-free entry to so many countries. That, I think, is the right approach to allow people to see for themselves rather than, you know, going through these filters of different, uh, you know, or different lenses, lenses uh, being applied. His Excellency Ambassador Hashimi, thank you so much for your insights and your time. Thank you. Thank you for watching this episode of The Hub on CGTN. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. I'll see you again next time.